Hello and welcome to this video on refraction and lenses exam questions and solutions. So the plan for today's video is that we will look at one, two, three, four, four short questions that have come up in previous years and then one, two, three, hopefully three long questions that have come up in previous years as well. So that's the plan for today's video. Just making sure we're still recording. Perfect. Okay, so let's have a look at our first question. This is a 2022 question and it's part of question 13. It's a seven mark question. Okay, so we've got a Huygens telescope, which was a converging lens arranged to produce a virtual image. We've been asked to draw a ray diagram to show how a converging lens can produce <clears throat> a virtual image. So first things first, let's set up our principal axes and next we're going to draw our converging lens. Okay, so there's our converging lens. We're gonna mark our focal length either side of our converging lens, important that it's equal distance on both sides. So I'm gonna mark F back here and F back here. In order to produce, I'm hoping everyone knows now at this, at this point, in order to produce a virtual image on a converging lens, the object, in this case, I'm just gonna draw an arrow and I call that the object, must be placed inside the focal length, okay? So our first light ray in parallel to the principal axis, and we should know that that comes out through the focal length on the far side. So there we go, that's our first I'll just get rid of that. That's our first light ray drawn. Now our second light ray, we're just gonna draw straight through the optic center and it's going to, if you recall, continue on in a straight line. Now, what you hopefully will have noticed from these two lines is that they are diverging. They are never going to meet so instead what we need to do is trace them backwards so that's what we're going to do now I'm going to trace both these lines obviously you guys are going to use a, a ruler to do this as accurately as you can but when we trace them backwards we see you eventually get to a point where both those lines will intersect it's the apparent intersection of light rays and it's back here somewhere and that is where our image is going to form and that is a virtual image using a converging lens so i hope that helps up next is a 2018 question 5 part e and you've been asked to calculate the speed of light in this material given the refractive index okay guys Always, always, always write down the information that we've been given. N is equals to 2.4. And we should know constant speed of light in air or in a vacuum is 3 by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. So next up, guys, very important, always write out your formula. N is equals to C1 over C2. And we're looking for the speed of light in this material so let's start filling in information into our formula we've got a refractive index of 2.4 so it's most likely it's diamond is equals to 3 by 10 to the power of 8 divided by c2 c2 is what we're looking for now i'm just going to bring Excuse me one second, give myself a bit more space. 
what we should hopefully be aware is that you can swap above and below the line on the opposite sides of an equal sign so that's just going to become c2 is equals to 3 by 10 to the power of 8 divided by 2.4 and at this point we grab our calculator and we get that c2 speed in that material is 1.25 by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second and that is our answer to that question another seven marks gained okay moving on to our next short question in your answer book copy the diagram on the right and show the light ray um incident on the interference between the glass and the air in your diagram sketch the refracted ray and the weak reflected ray okay now the key thing to note here guys is the critical angle of the glass is 42 degrees and we've got a light ray coming in at 42 degrees so when the light ray is equal to the critical angle well then the corresponding refracted angle is at 90 degrees so firstly that's the blue line that i'm after drawing there is the refracted ray okay so i'm just going to say blue is equals to the refracted ray so when our angle is at 42 degrees the our incident angle is at 42 degrees which is our critical angle the refracted ray will be at 90 degrees so it just travels along the surface of that glass block next up we've got the weak reflected ray and it's going to begin to become totally internally reflected so it's going to come back along that reflect back into the glass i'm just going to say that that angle of reflection is also equals to 42 degrees i'm just saying that the red line is equals to the reflected ray albeit it's weak you'll see only a small amount of it it'll be very very faint guys okay so that's our 2016 question five part c done again another um seven mark questions so nice and easy and our final short question that we're going to have a look at again is 2015 question five part c and take our information from the question we've been told that this material has a refractive index of 3.2 what is our critical angle and our formula is n is equals to one over sine of c which is in our log tables what we're looking for in this case is c we have our refractive index so let's fill in our information 3.2 is equals to 1 over sine of c again like previously we can swap above and below opposite sides of the equal sign so that becomes sine of c is equals to 1 over 3.2 now we're looking for c the critical angle not sine of c so to get rid of sine we're going to use sine inverse in our calculator and put in 1 over 3.2. So grab your calculator, sine inverse, and 1 over 3.2. And we get that C, our critical angle, is equal to 32 degrees. And that is that question finished and another 7 marks obtained or picked up. So now we're going to move on to the longer questions on refraction and lenses. So first question, 2015, question 12, part B, is we've got to copy the diagram on the right into your answer book and complete the path, complete the path, uh, excuse me, of the light ray through the section of the lens, include the normal at both faces. So we need to include a normal at our first face and our second face, our two points. So let's just real quickly, let's trace out this lens again as best we can. Okay, and we've got a light ray coming in. There's our light ray coming in. First, I'm gonna sketch my normal, which remember guys, 
is at 90 degrees to the point of contact. So we'll do that again. The normal is at 90 degrees to the point of contact. And you need to recall when so a light ray goes from a less dense to a more dense material, in this case, we're going from air into glass. I'm just gonna put a G in there for glass. G over here represents glass. It's our lens, obviously. The light ray bends towards the normal. So there's my light ray. Rather than continuing on in a straight line, it's gonna bend in towards the normal. Okay, now we need to draw our second normal. Again, I'm gonna draw it in blue, which again is at 90 degrees to the point of contact. So there's my second normal at 90 degrees to the point of contact. And in this instance, our light is going from a more dense to a less dense material. So it's going from glass back into air. So if it was to continue on a straight line, it would do so like that. However, we know that it's going to refract or it's going to bend and it's going to bend away from the normal. So rather than continuing that straight line, it's going to bend down something like so. Okay. So we've got our two points of contact and I'm just going to say blue represents the normal at the two points of incidence. Okay, so I hope that makes makes sense to everybody. So that's our first thing done for six marks. Always read the questions, guys. There's details in the question. You maybe use a highlighter like I'm doing to um, make the best of it. Draw a ray diagram to show the formation of a virtual image in a converging lens. Now, I've already done this in the very first question. So I'm just gonna draw your attention back over here and there is our light ray diagram of, of sorry, our light ray diagram with a converging lens producing a virtual image. So I'm actually just gonna take that. Fortunately, you guys probably can't do this. I'm gonna take this. Sorry. Okay, so what do we so we've got that already done on our previous diagram, so we're not going to do that again. Um up next we've got a converging lens of focal length 20 centimeters and a diverging lens of focal length 8 centimeters are placed in contact. Calculate the power of the combination. Okay, so our two formula we need to know for this question, guys. Power is equals to one over the focal length. And power total, T representing total, is power of the first lens plus the power of the second lens. So we also know focal length of one of the lenses is 20 centimeters. And the second lens f1 and f2 is eight centimeters now first thing i would have said in previous notes or previous videos is we need to always convert our unit for power is in per meters so we need to convert from centimeters into meters so that becomes 0 0.2 meters and this becomes 0 0.08 meters now we can find the power of our first lens which is one over 0 0.2 and the power of our second lens is 1 over 0 0.08 so p1 becomes 5 per meter and power 2 is 12.5 per meter. Now, key thing to note, F2 
that is a diverging lens. So it has a negative power. Very important we remember that. So in fact, this is minus 12.5. So getting our total power, P1 plus P2, it becomes five minus 12.5. So our total power is minus 7.5 per meter. So that is the ca calculate the power of the combination. What eye defect can be corrected using a converging lens? Well, using a converging lens, it is long sightedness that can be corrected. Apologies. That is 2015, question 12, part B, completed. Okay, just to add on to that, for a diverging lens, that can correct short-sightedness. So something that we need to be aware of. So next question is 2012. Question 12, part B. And unfortunately, guys, this is a real nasty question. However, we're gonna have a look through it anyway. First thing that's not drawn in this diagram that I'm gonna add in now straight away is our normal at 90 degrees to the point of contact. And second thing is this angle here, 30 degrees, is measured from our refracted ray back to the glass block. Remember, our refracted angle always measures back to the normal, which makes this our incident angle I, okay? So a couple of things there that they've not included in the diagram to make things a little bit more difficult. The next thing as well is we've got a light ray traveling from glass to air. Now, we're told here that the refractive index of glass is 1.5. There's nothing wrong with that. However, in this diagram, we've got a light ray traveling from glass to air, not from air to glass. So the refractive index of light when it travels from air into glass is 1.5. However, in this question here, we've got a light ray traveling from glass into air, which means we have to inverse this and it becomes 1 over 1.5. Okay, now I think we're pretty good to go. We know our formula. Always, always, always write out your formula, guys. You're going to pick up marks. The refractive index is sine of the incident angle over sine of the refracted angle. Now we know, in this case, N is 1 over 1.5, which is equal to sine of our incident angle I. We do not know that yet. That's what we're looking to try and find over sine of our refracted angle or which in this case is 60 degrees as i wrote in red now what we can do at this point guys is we can multiply both sides by sine of 60 and what we're left with is sine of our incident angle i is equals to sine of 60 divided by 1.5 okay or alternatively cross multiply 1 times sine 60 just stays as sine 60 1.5 times sine of i becomes 1.5 times sine i and then we want to divide 
both sides by 1.5 to leave sine i by itself. Okay, our last step then is, well, we can multiply out sine 60 if you want to. Sine 60 divided by 1.5. That gives us root three over three. I is equal to root 3 over 3. To get i by itself, we're going to sign inverse root 3 over 3. Just showing you step by step how we get that. And what we get is that that instant angle is 35.26 degrees. Now, if we have a look back at the question, the question asks us for the angle theta. Now we know that this angle up here is a right angle. So to find theta, excuse me, 90 minus 35.26 degrees. Gives us the theta is equal to 54.7 degrees. Now that guys is a horrible, horrible, horrible start to that question because of all the mitigating factors that they left out at the beginning, okay? So I said, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Um, up next is what would the value of the angle theta um, be so that the light ray emerges parallel to the side of the glass block. Okay, so basically, what is that critical angle going to be so that we get so that we get the light ray emerging parallel to the side of the glass block? So if I just trace that out, what that looks like is a light ray traveling along the side here. If that would be the case, we would need our incident angle to be um, the critical angle. So our formula there, n is equal to one over sine of the critical angle. Now we know our refractive index is 1.5, one over sine of c. What we can do again, guys, cross multiply above and below the line, and we're left with sine c is equal to one over, excuse me, excuse me, one over 1.5. In order to get the critical angle c, it will be sine inverse, because we want to use sine inverse to get rid of sine, so that we're left with just c, one over 1.5, and we get that our critical angle this case is 41.8 degrees. Now that is our critical angle, which refers to our incident angle again. You're asked, what would the angle theta be so that the light ray emerges parallel? So again, because this is a nasty question, we need to take this away from 90 degrees. getting 48.2 degrees is what that angle theta would need to be in order um, for the light ray to travel parallel to the surface of the glass block. Okay, last part of this question is to calculate the speed of the light as it passes through the glass block. Again, nice and simple, n is equal to C1 over C2, where C1 is 3 by 10 to the power of 8. It's as it's traveling through light, the speed of light as it travels through air over C2 is equals to our refractive index, which is 1.5. Again, cross multiply above and below the line, and you get 3 by 10 to the power of 8 over 1.5 is equals to C2. 
and you get c2 is equals to 2 by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second and that guys is that question finished okay moving on to our last question now which is a 2008 question 9 let me just check how we are for time okay what is meant by the refraction of light okay refraction of light is equals to the bending of light as it travels from one medium to another Okay, that's our first question. Second is state the laws of refraction. Okay, so law one is that the incident ray, the refracted ray incident angle The refracted angle and the normal all lie in the one plane. And our second uh, law of refraction is that the sine of our incident angle over sine of our refracted angle is equals to n, where n is a constant number. And there's our three definitions, guys. Definitions, we just need to learn them off. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at the next part of this question. So, we've been told an eye contains a lens system and a retina. The retina is the screen at the back of the eye, which is two centimeters from the lens system. The lens system contains, consists of the cornea, which acts as a fixed lens of power 38 per meter, and a variable internal lens just behind the cornea. The maximum power of the eye is 64 meters. Okay. So, um, let's have a look. What's the first thing we've been asked? Calculate how near an object can be placed in front of the eye and still be in focus. Well, guys, what I would definitely recommend when doing something like this is to draw a diagram. And that's exactly what I'm going to do here. So, I'm just going to pretend there's, there's my eye. Uh, actually, sorry, I'll go again. There's my eye, no, no Picasso, but it'll just have to do. And there's the lens at the front of the eye. Now, we've been told that the distance from the retina to the lens is two, cent I'll just write two centimeters, okay? So, the retina is like a screen where the image is going to form. So the first thing we know is that our image forming on the retina is going to be that distance from the lens to the to the image is two centimeters. Up next, what other piece of information have we been given? The other piece of information that we've been given is that the we've got a maximum power of 64 per meter. Okay, so that's the next really valuable piece of information. We're told that the maximum power of the lens is 64 per meter. 
Now we've got a formula where power is equals to one over F. And we're going to use this to find what is, what's the maximum or the minimum focal length of this lens, okay? So subbing in 64 is equals to one over F. Just swapping those numbers over or swapping F over with 64, you get that F is equals to one divided by 64. F is equals to 0 0.015. Okay, so that's in meters. So up next, divide that by 100, and we get that F is equals to 1.5, 1 1.56 centimeters. Okay, lovely. So now we know our second piece of information, F is equals to 1.56 centimeters as well. Where can our image or our object be placed so that we get an image forming on the screen? And our formula, one over U plus one over V is equals to one over F is gonna help us find that. So one over U is what we're looking for. One over V is, V is two over one over 1.56. Now, as usual, we're going to take all the values that we know to the right hand side of the equal sign and leave what we don't know on the left hand side. When you take something across the equal sign, again it changes sign and it becomes a minus. So grab your calculator now and let's put this in to our calculator. And we're left with 11 over 78. Now we've got one over u. We're gonna flip this around so that we get u over one and flip 11 to over 78 to 78 over 11. We get u is equals to 78 divided by 11 becomes 7.5. Centimeters. So our object can be placed seven centimeters in front of our eye and still see a clear image. After that, the image will become blurry if it comes in any clo any closer. So I hope you hope that helps with that part of the question. Like I said earlier, guys, draw a sketch sometimes where it can really really help. Um, it can help. Uh, figure out what it is that they're looking for in the question. Okay, the maximum power of the internal lens system. Okay, so we know that the maximum power of the eye is 64 and of the fixed lens it's 38. So we've got, apologies, P max is equal to the power of the lens plus the power of the internal system. So let's fill in. We know that the maximum power of the eye is 64. Of the lens, did we say it was 38? Plus the power of the internal system. So just taking one away from the other. Power of the internal system. we get 26 per meter. And that's the next part of the question done. I'm hoping that's nice and simple, we're all okay with that. <clears throat> so, next up, light is refracted as it enters the cornea from the air shown in the diagram. Calculate the refractive index. Again guys, always highlight the information and what the question is because there's a lot of detail in these questions. So our formula firstly, N is equals to sine I over 
sign of O. Now let's go back up and see what information we're given in the question. The incident angle is 37 and the refracted angle is 27, taken from the diagram. So that becomes sine of 37 over sine of 27 and we get that n is equals to 1.33. So the refractive index of the cornea is 1.33. Okay, we're getting there. Up next, draw a diagram to show the path of a ray of light as it passes from water of refractive index 1.33 into the cornea. Okay, so now, Let's have a look. Let's imagine we've got, sorry, we're going from water into the cornea. Now bear in mind, both of these have a refractive index of 1.33. So if a light ray travels from water into the cornea, it's just going to travel in a straight line because the refractive index is the same. Okay, so I'm hoping that makes sense to everybody. The refractive index of the water is 1.33. The refractive index of the cornea is 1.33. So therefore, light ray travels in a straight line. Now, a swimmer cannot see properly when she opens her eyes underwater. When underwater, why does the cornea not act as a lens okay well as we've said here earlier on guys the water and the cornea have the same refractive index therefore the water does sorry the cornea does not act as a lens so we're saying the water and the cornea So our cornea okay that's the first question S second part what is the maximum power of the eye so let's go back to this when underwater what is the maximum power of the eye well now the power of our the lens 38 per meter has been removed because it's the same as the refractive index of the water so the maximum power now is just the internal system which is 26 per meter okay the reason being because our cornea now no longer is functioning so that power of the cornea which we said earlier on was 38 now is out of action and we're just left with the internal structure of the eye which has a maximum power of 26 we calculated that earlier on why do objects appear blurred well it's the same as previously same as, as sorry it's the same as previous our eye is no longer strong enough okay because our cornea is no longer working strong i should probably should say powerful enough to refract or bend the light onto our retina 
okay and finally explain how wearing goggles allows objects to be seen clearly well when you wear goggles there's a pocket of air inside the goggle which then means that the light can bend as it's traveling from the air into your cornea so the goggles provide a pocket of air through which as it travels into our eyes. Okay guys, so that is us completed on this question now, 20, 2008 question nine. I hope this has helped you all and thanks again for watching. Cheers guys.